Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to our weekly sound check. How do I sound? Hear me? Am I clear?
Good morning, everyone. Happy, ooh, I like that sound. Happy Palm Sunday. It is exciting to get to celebrate this momentous day, the triumphal entry of our King Jesus and the celebration that ensues after. Um, if I have not met you yet, my name is Heather Jalad. I get to serve here as a community engagement pastor at Canon, and I have a few announcements that I wanna share with you. Everything that I mention, uh, you can find out more information about in your bulletin that you were handed on the way in and on the church's website at Canon Church. Dot org. Well, first and foremost is our spring fling that happens today, this afternoon, right here on campus, where we will welcome much of our community from 3 to 5 p.m. Invite your friends and neighbors if you haven't already. It is not too late. And if you want to be a part of welcoming our friends and neighbors in the community, then please, please show up to serve and really be an expression of Christ's love and hospitality to our neighbors uh, to today. There's going to be an egg hunt. Um, the weather is going to be beautiful, so it is a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, this is Holy Week. Today begins the beginning of Holy Week, this entire week where we follow Jesus to the cross, through the cross and to the resurrection of next Sunday that we celebrate Easter morning. Um, throughout this week, we will have prayer stations open here in the sanctuary um, from Monday through Friday from 12 to 3 p.m. Um, and from uh, Monday and Wednesday from 5 to 8 p.m. These are self-guided prayer stations. It's a wonderful time to come and just spend some time with Jesus to reflect and to meditate on what Christ has done for us and the gift that Christ has given us. This is something you can do alone. This is something you can bring family together to do. We will also have um, interactive prayer stations for the children out in the Narthex area there. So whenever you're able to come, we, um, we invite you to come and, and participate in those. Um, the next thing is, as a part of this Holy Week, is we will celebrate Maundy Thursday, this coming Thursday night at 7 p.m., with a service that is um, um, it's a somber service. We remember the night that Jesus gave his life up for us, that he gave himself up for us. And um, we will come to the table and get to share the Lord's Supper together as Christ shared that same meal with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. Um, as I said, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and you are invited to bring flowers for the cross uh, that will be out front here so we can make this a living, beautiful representation of the life that we have in Jesus. So bring what flowers from your yard. You can purchase flowers, whatever the case may be. Um, finally, next Sunday, as I said, is Easter Sunday, and so we will have an additional worship service. We will have um, a contemporary worship service at 9.30 a.m. here in the sanctuary, and then our traditional worship service of celebration here at 11 a.m., following. So whatever works for you and your family, we invite you to come. As you came in and you received your bulletin, there was a connect card in there. We invite you to register your attendance with us. Um, if you are a guest, we would love to get that information from you. As you seek to connect with us, we would love to connect with you and learn more about you and your family so that we can partner together in ministry. Um, if you are a regular uh, worshiper here at Canon, you can use that QR code if you've already given us that information. And, um, and then finally, you can put those in the offering baskets as those are passed when we receive offering after the message, or you can drop those in the offering boxes at, um, in both the Narthex and in the connector over here. Well, as we prepare to worship today, I invite you to, to join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for this celebration that we get to be a part of today. Turn our hearts and lives to you today and over the course of this week that we might walk faithfully to you, to the cross and to the resurrection celebration of Easter morning. May you inhabit our praises, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is... The king reigns forever <laughs> and comes to redeem us. Oops. His strength will carry us. He is here, humble but mighty, 
of sorrow and splendor, entering Jerusalem to save us. He is here. The crowd chants and shouts, proclaiming his reign, honoring the one who overcomes. He is here. He left his throne in heaven, needs no one to guard him. He is mighty and omnipotent. The king is here. Don't put your eye out. Don't put your eye out. In him dwells all treasure. His throne is wisdom and knowledge. His name alone is exalted. The king is here. He makes everything new. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The creator of all things. The king is here. He brings no army. Wields the sword of the word. He needs no protection. The king is here. He who begins and he who finishes, he who fulfills, the king is here. The one who offers himself, the one who sacrifices it all, who came to usher in the kingdom of God. That king, the only king, our king, he is here. Is here this morning. I was here a little early, and we are all there here is. to celebrate We're out? Sunday this morning. Oh, well, that's a good problem to have. There it is. <laughs> uh, as we begin this uh, service this morning together, let us raise our voices in song with Hosanna, loud Hosanna. As we are singing this Joseph. morning, feel free to wave your palms together. Will you please stand? I knew he was going to do that.
Uh, good morning, yes, my name is Taylor. My name is Taylor Jones, it's nice to see you all. Um, I will be leading us in our children's message this morning. Uh, so I'm going to give us a brief introduction. You guys are gonna learn some more downstairs. So I'm gonna give you a brief introduction about what Palm Sunday is. You might already know a little bit, but first, we're gonna talk about donkeys because there's a key animal in our lesson today, which is the donkey. So my lovely mother is helping me today with holding our donkey. Have any of you heard of the game, Pin the Tail on the Donkey? Have any of you played it? Keep your hand up if you've played it. Adults as well, please play along. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. All right, what's a place where you would play this game? Have you played it, Charlie? Birthday party. I've definitely played it at a couple of my birthday parties when I was a kid. Another example? At the house. Okay, we'll play it with some friends and family when we're playing at a celebration. So it kind of ties in with our Palm Sunday today. All right, well, I'm going to have a child volunteer. Is it okay, I saw you first. Come on up, Amber. I'm going to put my microphone down for one second. So Hunter here is going to attempt to pin this tail that I've given him onto our donkey. Go give it a shot. Where a tail would be on a donkey. Ooh, straight up and down. Bold choice. Love it. This is an excited donkey. Thank you so much. A little round of applause for my volunteer, please. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to have another volunteer, except I'm not going to get a kid this time. I'm going to actually have our lovely Pastor Tim come help me out here, please. <laughs> Thank you for being voluntold. <laughs> so, Hunter, was that hard or was that easy? How was that? Easy, he said. He said it was easy. Pastor Tim, we're going to make this a little bit more difficult for you. I'm going to blindfold you. Okay, and we're gonna give you a tail. Here you go, right there you go. Tape's up top, you can see. All right, and I'm gonna spin you around just once. Just once, all right, come with me. <laughs> Great, all right, the donkey is right in front of you. You can put your hand out and feel the paper. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> and go ahead and do your best, put a tail on that donkey. Ooh, let's show the crowd before Pastor Tim takes blindfold off. All right, go ahead and take the blindfold off, please, and we'll see what you've done. Now, I played a little trick on our pastor, it's true. You can go ahead and take your bite off. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our pastor today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna be stay up here. So, what we have here is pin the tail on the donkey. Now, can we see that first slide one more time, please, Mom? Thank you so much. A donkey, pretty easy, Hunter said. Pastor Tim, how was that? Was that easy? No, it was hard. A, he couldn't see. B, we switched it up on him and played a prank, did we not? Now, I wanna talk about what the donkey, and why the donkey, and why Jesus chose a donkey, because Jesus chose a donkey. Now, Jesus is king, right? Jesus is king. When you think about your Disney movies or your fairy tales, what does a king or a prince ride? Does he ride a donkey? Mm. Prince Charming doesn't normally ride a donkey. What does he ride? A horse, a white stallion, a steed. Right? A much more noble animal than a donkey. But Jesus chose a donkey for humility. But also, I want to point out why I chose to play Pin the Tail on the Donkey here. So Pin the Tail on the Donkey, on our first side, we have a very clear target. We're going to put our tail at the back side of our donkey. Donkey's nice and big, easy to see. Hunter was not spun around and disoriented. He could see clearly. It was very easy. The people of the time of Jesus had a very clear idea in their head of what a king would do, of what Christ would do, and they wove their palm branches, celebrating and welcoming the new king, because they knew, they thought that this was the Christ, the one who was coming to save them, but they thought they had their own goal in mind for what Jesus was going to do. They thought that he was going to save them from the governments that was oppressing them, from the Romans, but actually, if you turn around one more time, Jesus had a completely different goal in mind, a harder target to get, that the people were completely blind to. They couldn't see this goal at all. Jesus did not come to save the people from the Romans, but actually from our sins. And next week, when we talk about Easter and bunny rabbits and crosses, 
the cross is the ultimate goal that Jesus had in mind. So we're going to have you guys join us, Sasha, downstairs. And would you like to pray? All right, we're going to have you guys bow our hands really quickly for our prayer. Get our hearts and mind ready for our lesson with God. Just put your hands together, put your heads down. Repeat after me, dear Lord. Thank you for today and coming to save us from not the easy goal, but from our sins. Amen. Testament, uh, the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Zion. If you Jerusalem. will, just imagine with me. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you will just imagine with me if I had the pleasure of bringing out Christ. This is just how I would do it. It ain't got to be the way you do it. You might not think it's just right, but this is how I would do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction. His credits are too long to list. He has done the impossible time after time. He hailed out of a manger in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, by way of heaven. His mother is still headlining in the Catholic Church today. His daddy is the author of a book that has been on the bestseller list since the beginning of time. He holds the record for the world's greatest fish fry. He fed 5,000 hungry souls with two fish, five loaves of bread. He can walk on water, turn water into wine, no special effects, no camera tricks. He has a headshot on every church fan across the country. Even before the kings of comedy, he was hailed the king of all kings, ruler of the universe, alpha and omega, beginning and the end. The bright and the morning star. Some say he's the Rose of Sharon, and some say he's the Prince of Peace. Get up on your feet. Put your hands together and show your love for the second coming of the one and only. How would you introduce Jesus? 
how would you introduce Jesus? We're getting ready for Easter. We've been getting ready for Easter for five weeks so far. We've been getting ready for Easter by walking with Jesus through the Gospel of Matthew. We've been doing that in worship in, in this sanctuary together, Sunday after Sunday. Many of us also have been doing that by reading the Gospel according to Matthew uh, each day through these five weeks so far in the season of Lent. We've been getting ready for Easter by walking with Jesus through the Gospel of Matthew. And we have discovered, and we'll keep discovering as we do that, that Jesus fulfilled the promises of God, that Jesus fulfilled the purposes of God for us and for all in unexpected ways. And he calls us to follow his unexpected path. This morning, that path took him and takes us to Jerusalem, to the triumphal entry. Toward Jesus' long last arrival in the city of God, the city of the King, the holy city, Jerusalem. And we'll hear that Jesus makes his own introduction. That Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was his self introduction to the people of that city. He managed all of it, arranged for this introduction to the people of Israel. He arranged for this introduction, not only to them, but also to us. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? Reading from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them back immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet from Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. How would you introduce Jesus? How would you answer the question asked by the people of Jerusalem, who is this? The question seems, on the surface, ridiculous when we read this story. Isn't it obvious who this is? Isn't it obvious that this is Jesus? But if you think about it, it's not surprising that the people of Jerusalem aren't really sure just who this is. I'm sure they have heard stories about Jesus. They've heard lots of rumors about Jesus, this prophet from Galilee. But they haven't laid eyes on him. They haven't seen him. They don't know him by sight. The crowds who accompany him into the city, they do know who this is. They know who it is of whom they are shouting and singing and greeting with cloaks and palm branches laid before him like a red carpet on the way into the city. But the people of Jerusalem aren't really sure. They are absolutely sure that this is a a major disruption, that this is a major event, a large crowd coming into the city surrounding a man seated on a donkey and they are greeting him as a king. Hosanna to the son of David. Who is this that the people are greeting as a king, a king coming into the city? Of course, Matthew has written his gospel to answer that question, who is this? But the people of the city are asking that question because they are confused, but also disturbed. I mean, the word in our translation that says that the whole city, you know, is, is in turmoil. It's a word that actually literally means shaken. The city is shaken. It's the exact same word that is used by Matthew in chapter 2 when the Magi, the wise men, come from the east and they come to Jerusalem and they ask Herod, the current king of Israel, 
the current king of the Jews, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? And Matthew tells us that Herod and the whole city are disturbed. They are shaken. Same word we get in chapter 21. And in fact, it's a word that Matthew will use one more time when Jesus is crucified, when he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he gives up his spirit and he dies. Matthew tells us that in that moment when Jesus dies, the curtain of the temple in the, in the temple of God is torn in two and the earth shakes. Very same word. In other words, the people of Jerusalem, when they ask, who is this? They're not just curious. They're not just confused. They are significantly disturbed because his entrance into the city is a major disruption. It's earth shaking. World changing. Who is this? I mean, after all, for Jews to welcome anyone into their city with shouts of Hosanna, son of David, is highly likely to get the attention of the Romans who believe that it's their job, their right, their power, their authority to decide, to determine, to decree who the king will be in Jerusalem or if there'll be any king at all in Jerusalem. You can't just enter the city shouting out, Hosanna, son of David, and not expect some significant and probably violent attention from the Romans. Who is this? And of course, as I've already mentioned, Matthew has written his gospel to answer that question. And by the time we get to chapter 21, Matthew has told us a lot about Jesus. He has told us, if we go back to the very beginning, that this Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is the son of Joseph, who was told to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the one who preaches the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. He is the one who heals the sick and casts out demons and cleanses lepers and raises the dead and feeds thousands. He walks on water, stills the storm. It is this Jesus who has entered Jerusalem. It is this Jesus who has entered Jerusalem, seated on a donkey, deliberately echoing, deliberately acting out the words we've just heard from the book of Zechariah. An Old Testament prophet, 500 years before Jesus, telling of a day when a king would come, a king would return, a son of David would come to the city of Jerusalem. And he would come in victory, but he would come seated on a donkey and not on a war horse. He would come in peace. He would come humbly. And the word we translate humble in that passage is the very same word that Jesus uses in, the, in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Your king comes to you meek on a donkey to inherit the earth. Jesus stage manages his arrival in the city. He doesn't need a donkey. It's not like it's physically required for him to enter in this way. He's deliberately evoking these words, this prophecy from Zechariah, that the people clearly know. They know their Bibles because why else would they shout out, Hosanna to the son of David? We get it. We see it. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the king who is to come. You are the one who will bring peace to Jerusalem, peace to God's people. You are the one who will fulfill the promises of God. And Jesus stage manages this introduction deliberately to provoke the most unexpected turn in his story. Because, of course, the religious leaders are outraged. They're shocked. They're stunned. We didn't hear that part of the story. 
After entering into the city, Jesus goes to the temple and he drives out the money changers, those buying and those selling from the temple. The children in the temple itself pick up the song they've just heard and they shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. And the religious leaders ask Jesus, do you hear what they're saying? This entrance is provocative. This entrance is confrontational. It is joyous and chaotic. It's also as if Jesus is looking for a fight. He's looking to provoke the hostility of the powers that be. And of course, it's because, precisely because, the kingdom he brings will come through the cross. That's what we heard last week. When Jesus asked his disciples in private, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they all gave the same answer we ultimately hear from the crowd as well on Palm Sunday, a prophet. But who do you say that I am? And Peter stepped up and spoke for the twelve and said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus immediately predicted his own betrayal, suffering, death, and resurrection, and made clear, and makes clear once again on Palm Sunday that his kingdom will come through a cross. He comes humbly on the donkey, not a war horse. And the very same crowd that cries out in acclamation, Hosanna, son of David, will within just one week cry out, crucify him. crucify him. Because they did want peace, but they didn't want peace through the cross. They wanted it through a war horse, a war leader. Some of you have heard me mention before, James uh, Davison Hunter wrote a book called To Change the World. He's got a brilliant insight that is worth repeating, and it comes, up to, comes to mind for me on Palm Sunday. Hunter observed that when cultures are healthy, when, 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 when a culture is kind of flourishing, every area of the culture flourishes. Families flourish, the economy flourishes, the arts flourish, education flourishes, just kind of, you know, rising tide lifts all boats to change metaphors on us for a moment. You know, when a culture is flourishing, every segment of the culture flourishes, but in times of crisis, when anxiety is high and fear is peaking and everything is sort of falling apart and the ties that have bound us are frayed or, or cut and everything is spiraling out of control, everything ultimately becomes political. This pattern repeats itself over and over in human history. When we're scared, everything always becomes all about politics. Why? Because it's in the political realm that we find coercive power. It's in the political realm that we find the power, we get the leverage to make people do what we want done. The world was wrong. Rome was in charge. The people of God were in the Holy Land, but they were under foreign dominion once again. When would the kingdom come? How would it come? We just need enough power. We just need a war leader, a warrior king. And instead, Jesus came humble on a donkey. And because of that entrance and the reaction it provoked from the powers that be, he was ultimately crucified and then raised and then called his disciples then and calls us today to follow him on the way of the cross. How would you introduce Jesus? He is the son of David. He is the king who has come. But he's the king 
who has conquered through the cross, whose kingdom has come, is coming, and will come through crucified love, not coercive power. Last Sunday was, as you know, St. Patrick's Day. The choir was in green, and this, this morning, on our Palm Sunday, they're in purple. Many of you wore green. On Monday morning, I heard St. Patrick's story again, but this time I heard it in far greater detail than I ever had. I've told part of his story before, and I kind of grieved that I hadn't heard that, that, that story uh, in time for last Sunday. But you get it this Sunday. Um, <laughs> Because, like, most of us know the basics of St. Patrick's story, that he wasn't actually Irish, that he grew up in Britain, and then he was captured by Irish uh, slaveholders, and they, you know, he became a, a shepherd, he was a slave, and then he escaped, and he went back to Britain, and then he went back to Ireland, and then the whole of Ireland became Christian. End of story. Well, a couple things, like, there's so much more to his story, and it's such a beautiful example of someone who followed the king who comes humbly riding on a donkey. I mean, he was a Roman Briton. He was not Irish. We, I think we all know that. I did not realize, and I took Latin in high school, so I'm embarrassed about this, his name, Patricionis, means uh, of the patrician class. He was wealthy and powerful. His parents had a large estate. His father was a priest. Uh, and so he grew up as a child of privilege. His kidnapping by Irish raiders was more horrifying than I realized. In all honesty, the way I'd heard the story before, it's kind of like he was out in the fields and they kind of came ashore and then they grabbed him and then they took him back to Ireland. No, they conducted a nighttime raid on his parents' estate. Patrick was sleeping at home alone in their house. They broke in, found him, took him out of his bed, put him in chains along with others they had captured from his parents' estates and then took them back to Ireland. He was sold to a farmer in the north of Ireland who then sent him out to tend the sheep, which was the lowest of the low. That was the worst possible job to have. The least, like the lowest status job in Ireland at that time was to tend the sheep. And so here is Patricius of the patrician class tending sheep. Here's another thing I didn't know. When he was a young man, he renounced his faith, not just the Christian faith, any faith. He proclaimed himself an atheist. But then Patrick himself wrote about the time that he spent out in the fields with the sheep. And how he turned to God in his loneliness and his suffering. And he found God had never left him even though he had left God. And he experienced the love and the grace and the mercy of God and also the presence of God with him in the fields. And he began to pray constantly, engaging with God constantly. Long story short, God gave him a vision of his own escape from slavery. He did make it out of Ireland. It's a whole like thrilling, perilous story. He goes back home to England, Britain. Goes home to his parents' estate and then begins to have a series of visions in which he is called to go back to Ireland, the land of his bondage. And he said no. The visions keep coming and he keeps saying no. No way, I'm not going back there. But the Irish themselves appear in his vision and they say come to Ireland, walk among us as Jesus walked among the people. And so eventually he said yes. Now, the way I heard the story is he says yes to the invitation to go back to Ireland and then immediately gets in a boat and goes to Ireland, lands, starts preaching, and the whole country gets converted just like that. <laughs> and he also drove out all the stories. Actually, he took years to train, to be trained as a priest and a missionary. And then he went and the whole country wasn't converted. What he did instead was he went village by village, tribe by tribe, and shared the gospel with people. And it was very challenging and it was very difficult and it was not at all easy. I mean, first of all, a lot of people thought he should not go to Ireland at all because they believed the Irish were subhuman and not worth evangelizing. And so it was controversial that he went to those people at all, but he went. 
And then Ireland was divvied up into all these little tribal kingdoms, and so he had to go kingdom by kingdom, tribe by tribe. And a few people here and a few people there would hear the gospel, believe in Jesus, and their lives were changed and their world was disrupted. For example, a lot of women from privileged families of rank came to faith in Jesus. In part because Francis encouraged them to uh, become brides of Christ. Now here's the thing, in that world, women of privileged families were married off for political power, right? They were used as pawns, as tools. When they became brides of Christ, they took themselves out of that marriage market. They really took control of their own lives and devoted themselves to Jesus. How do you think that went over with the parents? Not too well. And then Francis revealed to the sons of those same families that all people are created in the image of God and those who come to faith, including their slaves and their servants, all people who come to faith in Jesus are their brothers and sisters in Christ, in Jesus. How do you think that changed their relationships with their servants and their slaves? And how do you think that went over with mom and dad? Francis was beaten repeatedly. The work of the gospel in Ireland for decades, patiently, lovingly serving people. Because Francis followed a king on a donkey. He came meekly and humbly, whose kingdom has come, is coming, will come, only can come through crucified love, through self-giving love through self-emptying love. How would you introduce Jesus? How will we introduce Jesus? We live at a time when we really do need to reintroduce Jesus to the church and the world. Is he a king who has come humbly, riding on a donkey, straight to a cross, and then an empty tomb. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for the gift of your son Jesus, for his entry into Jerusalem, into the holy city, in humble triumph, in self-giving love. We pray that our hearts and our homes, our church, our community would be wide open to Jesus, that very same Jesus, as he comes once again humbly and meekly, in self-giving love, to rule over all. In your kingdom of love, amen. Christ the first and last.
Thank you so much. Well, uh, every month, Canaan Church has a mission focus a, where we have opportunities to both pray and give and to serve. And this month, our focus has been Kairos Prison Ministry. And um, take a look at this video, and then I'll share some more. I'm going to tell you about Kairos. This prison ministry that comes inside them walls. It's a dead man. A lot of people say we dead men. I mean, I was just a mad man. Everybody got a story. But when you really get touched by God, that's when you know you got a real story. Well, my name is Tommy Fisher. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I grew up in the street gangs there. I got a lot of trouble. I ended up doing 20 years, 11 months flat in prison. I had an aggravated life sentence. I wasn't supposed to never get out. I ran the gangs in prison, you know, and I hurt a lot of men for some crazy reasons. I used to actually get Christians beat up because they say they wanted to come to Christ. That's how crazy and radical I was. But when they pick Kairos, they only pick the worst inmates on the unit because they want the roughest dudes on the unit, the fools, to get changed. And this ministry is actually going in here and showing this love and changing people like that. I'm gonna tell you the truth, I went for their food. I didn't go to get saved, but God had set me up. When I was sitting there, man, you know, I was listening to this dude talk. You know when Paul was on the road to Damascus and Jesus, just Jesus' presence knocked him off that horse? I know for a fact I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I felt it like Paul felt it. And from that day forth, man, God has just been blessing my life. While I was in that prison, I got into this third upon theological seminary and Bible Institute. I got a bachelor's degree in biblical studies. I also went to college and I got me an LBT. I just thank God for God bless me. I got a license to counsel. You know, and I really thank God for what he changed me into because I used to be a monster. I used to really be a monster. The only reason why I don't know if I ever killed a man because I never went back and asked the man who I shot was he dead. But I shot a lot of people and I hurt a lot of people's lives. But ministries like Kairos can go inside them walls and show a man it's God's love. Man, if I can tell anybody, anybody about Kairos, man, it's changing lives. Because I got to give God back what he gave me. He gave me back my life. He gave me them years that the locust stole from me. He gave them back to me. <laughs> and I'm thankful for it. All right, I'm going to try to get through the rest of this. Um, God's setting more people up because we got a, a Kairos weekend coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, two of ours, Deb and uh, Deb Sumter and Mike Bohannon, will be um, serving on those weekends in two different prisons. And um, in support of them, uh, we are um, taking your contributions so that when those inmates come and get to eat together, that they know that they are loved by the church and that the church sees the, the future and the purpose that Christ has for each and every one of them. And so we invite you to give to this month's mission of the month in Kairos Prison Ministry. A couple weeks ago, we showed a video um, that also showed what happens on, um, on a weekend. And one of those things is a prayer chain. And so um, it's a beautiful chain of paper with the names of people that are praying for the inmates that weekend, for that particular weekend. And so on April the 14th, we will have an opportunity to do that, to take these little slips of paper and write our names and maybe a passage of scripture or whatever, and we will, we will connect to that chain, and those will be taken um, on those weekends as well. So be on the, the lookout for that. Um, as we continue in worship, um, let's join our hearts and minds in prayer. 
God of the foolish cross, riding down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. You are not the savior we expect. Your power doesn't look like the power we want our God to demonstrate. Your wisdom makes no sense to us. We are happy to join the crowd waving branches, but not so sure we want to follow you into the temple courts, into the upper room, into the garden of Gethsemane, to the foot of the cross. Forgive our false assumptions. Clarify our clouded vision. Let us relax into the foolishness of your love, your grace. Hosanna. Hosanna. Save us. Through the Holy Spirit, guide us in the week ahead to remember our place in your great and ongoing story of resurrection, redemption, and restoration through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in worship, we have the opportunity to give back. Give back to God just a portion of all that God has graced and blessed us with. When you give to Canon Church, you give to the mission and ministry, both here, um, within the church, and into the wider community. We have a lot of things to celebrate about the impact of this church and the growing family of God here at Canon. Uh, last Sunday, we were able to welcome seven new uh, members to Canon Church to be a part of the Canon Church family, and that is certainly a celebration. Can we celebrate that? And this past Thursday, just a little over a year since we began the worshiping community, the, the table, gather at the table dinner church at the Southeast Gwinnett Co-op, we had three baptisms and three people that we invited and welcomed into the family of God through these public professions of faith. And that is certainly something to celebrate. <laughs> So as we prepare to give back, know that we have much to celebrate and much to share with the love and grace of God. In just a moment, the offering baskets will be passed. Um, you can place your offering and your Connect cards in there at that time. Um, you can also give online or you can drop your offerings in the offering boxes, both at the back of the sanctuary and the narthex and in the connector over here.
and everlasting God, as we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road shouting, Hosanna, as Jesus passed. We know they were looking for a Messiah who was different from who you sent Jesus to be. Not one of political power and military might, but one who came in compassion and mercy to heal, love, and save. Search our hearts that we might be confident that the Messiah for whom we long is the one you know we need, Jesus Christ, your anointed one, in whose name we pray. Amen. Will you please stay standing for our closing song, Jesus is Messiah. Two. sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness, he humbled himself and carried the cross,
Friends, as we follow Jesus from the service of worship to the world that he loves, may we follow the one whose kingdom comes through the cross, who has shaken and will shake the world through the power of his love, not the love of power. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and flow through you all week long. In Jesus' name, amen.